Hello again, Econ 160. It's Professor Kunk here with yet another video lecture. Today, as I record this, it's April 15th. And you know what? I think I'm going to quit it with the COVID-19 updates because honestly, it's kind of depressing. And let's think of something positive for a change, huh? And besides, by the time most of you watch this, the information will probably be outdated anyway. Uh, but also one more thing, I decided to go back to a one video per lecture format it's easier for me to produce, and with the timestamps, you should have no problem focusing in on the areas you need. So with that being said, let's get on to today's lecture. Today's lecture is on the subject of game theory. And the main motivation is that, as we saw with the last lecture on oligopolies, the analysis of strategic interactions can get pretty complex. So the question is whether there's a general set of principles or tools that we could use that would both simplify the analysis and also apply to a wide range of problems as well? Well, the answer to that question is yes. But to start with, we'll have to spend some time identifying what are some of the elements that are common to all strategic games. And then we'll take a look at the steps necessary to solve a game. And then what kinds of predictions those analytical steps can lead to. And finally, we'll take these tools and we'll apply them to last lecture's oligopoly problem and see that they can reproduce the same answer, but in a simpler way. And the person you see on the right here is John Nash, who is considered the father of modern game theory for his proof of the existence of what's now known as Nash equilibrium. And this handsome man that you see here on the left is Russell Crowe, who played John Nash in the Oscar-winning film titled A Beautiful Mind. The resemblance is pretty good, isn't it? Okay, so what is game theory? Game theory is the branch of economics and applied mathematics that studies strategic interactions between self-interested agents. So agents is just a fancy way of saying a decision maker, which can be people, uh, but can really represent any entity that's making a decision, whether that's a household, a company, or a government. And self-interested isn't actually a very restrictive assumption because we can have a pretty broad definition of what self-interest means, right? So we can modify our definition of self-interest to include feelings of altruism or other types of preferences over social outcomes, like benevolence for the poor, for example. Game theory has a wide range of application from business and economics, which you already know since it's in this class, uh, but it also has applications to things like international relations and politics, and even to the design of computer networks, right? Since it's possible to model each computer in the network as a self-interested agent, and thus the behavior of computers on a network fall under the umbrella of game theory. The formal study of game theory became a matter of strategic importance during the Cold War, uh, because the consequences of strategic interaction became staggeringly high. Right? That's the kind of consequences we're talking about here. So before we can study game theory, we have to first define what we mean by a game. We're used to thinking of games as a set of rules and a scoring system that determines the winner. Welcome to Game Night. Tonight we're going to be playing Risky Settlers, Knights, and Allies of the Lords of Dominion of Earth, Pandemic Edition. While that's true, in game theory, instead of getting lost in all the rules details, we actually want to think of games at a more abstract level and boil games down to their minimum core components. And the minimum components of a game are the following. First, of course, we have to define the players. Second, we have to define the strategies that each player can choose to take. And finally, there needs to be some mapping from the player's chosen strategies into each player's payoffs, meaning uh, their score of the game or their utility or their profit that they get from playing the game. Let's give our first example, Rock, Paper, Scissors. I'm sure all of you know how to play this game, but let's see how it would be described in the language of game theory. First, we have the players. We'll just call them player one and player two. Second, we have the strategies. The strategies basically represent the choices that you can make. So there's gonna be three for each player, either rock, paper, or scissors. And finally, the payoffs. The payoffs would take a long time to write down, but basically it goes like this. If player one chooses rock and player two chooses scissors, then player one scores one and player two scores minus one. 
Uh, the 1 and the minus 1 here are just arbitrary scores. It doesn't really matter. If player 1 chooses rock and player 2 chooses rock, then both players score 0. And if player 1 chooses rock and player 2 chooses paper, then player 1 scores minus 1 and player 2 scores 1. Okay, and so on, and we can go down the list. Okay, so rock, paper, scissors was a really simple example. But what about something a bit more complicated, like chess? Well, for chess, it's still simple to write down who the players are. That's just white and black. The strategies, on the other hand, the strategies get complicated. In chess, the strategies that a player could choose are all the possible plans of action, where a plan of action tells you what to do at every possible position of the board, including when to resign and when to offer or accept a draw. There are more possible strategies in chess than there are atoms in the universe. Finally, we get to the payoffs. The payoffs are simple in principle. If white strategy and black strategy together results in a checkmate by white or a resignation by black, then white scores one point and black scores zero. If the strategies together result in a checkmate by black or a resignation by white, then white scores zero and black scores one. And finally, if their strategies result in a draw, then both sides score one half. So while the payoffs are simple in principle, in practice, it's actually not even possible to write down one full strategy for chess. There are simply too many positions of the board to write down an entire strategy. And so even chess grandmasters are only going to memorize opening strategies that go a handful of moves deep, and then they play the rest by brilliance and instinct. So although we fully know the rules of chess, we actually can't fully solve chess since we can't even write down the strategies or the payoffs. For today, we're going to focus on a handful of illustrative games that are relatively simple, but cover a pretty wide range of strategic phenomena. The first and most famous of these games is called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And the story for The Prisoner's Dilemma goes something like this. The police have arrested two suspects for a crime. They think both of them are guilty. Trying to get a confession out of both of them, the police separate them into separate interrogation rooms and say, Look, we have enough evidence to put both of you away for a year. But I know this wasn't your idea. You just got roped along into it. Listen, if you just tell me your side of the story, I'll put in a good word for you with the judge. Heck, you might even go free if this was all your partner's doing. So the suspects then think to themselves, Hmm. If I talk, I can pin the blame on the other guy. As long as he doesn't also talk, then I can go free. But if he talks and I don't, then he'll pin the blame on me, and he'll walk while I get hit with the full 10 years in jail. If we both talk, then I guess we'll both be convicted, but at least the judge might reduce my sentence to 8 years instead of 10. So here's the summary of the prisoner's dilemma in terms of game theory. The players are suspect 1 and suspect 2. Their strategies are to either talk or not to talk. And their payoffs are, if neither talks, then they each get one year in prison. If one talks but the other doesn't, then the one who talks goes free. The one who didn't talk gets 10 years in prison. If they both talk, then they both get 8 years. So if you were a suspect in this situation, what would you do? So before we go further into the prisoner's dilemma, let me first introduce a concept known as the normal form of a game. Now the normal form is just a fancy way of summarizing all the information about a game in a table format. And so the way we construct the normal form is as follows. We first put the decisions of one of the players on the rows, like this, and we put the decisions of the other player on the columns, like so. And each box of the table is going to correspond to the payoffs that each player gets based on the choices of all the players together. So this is the box for if player 1 chose option A and if player 2 chose option A, and this is player 1's payoffs in that situation and this is player 2's payoffs in that situation. Or if player 1 chose B, and player 2 chose A, then we'd look at this box. And this would be player 1's payoff in that situation, and this would be player 2's payoff in that situation. 
So that's how we read and construct the normal form of a game. And the normal form is a convenient tool that helps us analyze the outcomes of a game because we can quickly summarize all of the relevant information and we can also quickly figure out what each player should do in every situation. So now let's return to the prisoner's dilemma and analyze it using the normal form. And the normal form is written here and it shows that if both suspects stay silent, then they each get one year. If suspect one talks and suspect two doesn't, then suspect one will walk and suspect two will get 10 years. If suspect two talks and suspect one doesn't, then suspect one gets 10 years and suspect two walks. And finally, if they both talk, they both get eight years. So how do we use the normal form to solve the game? We're basically going to approach it with the same logic that we did for the oligopoly example. We're going to figure out what suspect one would do for each possible scenario of what suspect two is doing. And then we're going to do the same for suspect two. And finally, we're going to figure out how their decisions interact by looking for a Nash equilibrium. So starting from step one, figuring out what suspect one should do for each possible choice of suspect two. All right, so we'll start here. If suspect, uh, if suspect two chooses not to talk, then suspect one is comparing these two payoffs between not talking and talking. If he doesn't talk, then he gets one year. If he does talk, then he'll go free. So he'll choose to talk and therefore go free. And so let's circle the best outcome for suspect one if suspect two is choosing not to talk. Now let's figure out what to do if suspect two does talk. If suspect two is talking, then suspect one is comparing this outcome with this outcome. So either get 10 years by not talking or get eight years by talking. And based on that, suspect one would again choose to talk in order to get eight years instead of 10. So let's circle the best outcome for suspect one if suspect two chooses to talk. And that's it for suspect one. And now let's repeat the process for suspect two. If suspect one chooses not to talk, then suspect two is comparing between these two outcomes. He can either get one year by not talking or go free by talking. So he'll choose to talk and go free and so let's mark that outcome for him. Now, if suspect one is choosing to talk instead, then suspect two is comparing between these two outcomes. And so he'll choose to get eight years here instead of 10 by talking instead of not talking. And so let's circle that for suspect two. Okay, so now stepping back, we've circled each player's best choice in each situation of what the other player would do. Is there any Nash equilibrium here? Remember, the definition of a Nash equilibrium is when each player is choosing their best strategy, given the strategies that the other players have chosen. And so based on that definition, the only Nash equilibrium is here, where we've circled both of the outcomes. And that's because if suspect two is talking, then suspect's one best choice is to talk. And if suspect one is talking, then suspect two's best choice is also to talk. And so we're at a stable outcome here. But let's consider another possibility and see why that other possibility is not a Nash equilibrium. If suspect one is talking and suspect two is not talking, is that a Nash equilibrium? Well, both players have to be choosing their best strategies given the situation. All right, so if suspect two is not talking, right, then suspect one's best strategy is indeed to talk. Okay, but, right, if suspect one is talking, is suspect two's best choice to stay silent? It's not, right? If suspect one is talking, then suspect two is better off talking too, right? So this is not a Nash equilibrium because suspect two isn't making the best choice. So the only Nash equilibrium here is the one where both suspects are talking and where they get eight years in prison. But the strange thing is, right, they could both have done better if they could have just agreed not to talk, but they couldn't. And so the question now is, why not? The answer to that question is that they can't cooperate because they can't credibly commit to their promises, right? Even if they were to promise each other beforehand not to talk to the police, once they're inside that interrogation room, each one actually has an incentive to break their promise. 
and regardless of what the other player does, it's still better for myself to just talk. It's actually a lot like the problem for why oligopolistic firms found it hard to collude. Because even if they tried to make an agreement, each producer would have an individual incentive to cheat on the agreement. So the prisoner's dilemma is an important and very well-known game, which is used to illustrate situations where society could be better off if everyone agreed to cooperate, but cooperation is difficult to achieve since everyone has an incentive to renege on their agreements. So why is the prisoner's dilemma such a well-known game? Because it very helpfully illustrates a large number of difficult real-life situations. For example, the nuclear arms race has often been compared to a prisoner's dilemma. It would be better for the safety of the world if we didn't build so many nukes, but each country on their own has an incentive to make sure that they have more nukes than anyone else. Another example of a prisoner's dilemma is the tragedy of the commons. Without strict enforcement, there's just too much incentive by individuals to overuse natural resources. Global warming is another example of a prisoner's dilemma slash tragedy of the commons in the sense that the future might be more secure if all countries could agree to reduce their emissions, but each country on their own has an incentive not to. Third, you could consider political attack ads as a kind of prisoner's dilemma. Both politicians get their image hurt during a grueling back and forth ca uh, negative campaign, um, and they might both be better off if they agreed not to attack each other, but there's just too much incentive to attack that they can't really stop it if they want to win. And fourth, a modern day example that I think is a prisoner's dilemma is the prevalence of clickbait. The internet would probably be a more pleasant place if there wasn't so much clickbait, but websites and content creators have just too much incentive to draw eyeballs however they can that it would be hard for them to agree not to use clickbaity titles or thumbnails. So for all these prisoners' dilemmas, is cooperation hopeless, or is there a way to get people to cooperate on doing the right thing? The answer is, it depends. In the prisoners' dilemma that we analyzed, the game was only played once and there were no outside actors. And so hope for quote unquote fixing the prisoner's dilemma lies in these two assumptions. First, if the game isn't played just once, but repeated over and over, like in the interaction between two oligopolistic firms, they can sometimes manage to cooperate through the threat of future punishment down the road. So for example, they could say, if you don't cooperate with me today and limit your production, then next year I'll flood the market. Cooperation only works, however, if the threat of punishment is credible and if it exceeds the incentive to break the agreement. Another possibility is to have some external actor enforce cooperation. So for example, the government might step in to intervene in some prisoners' dilemmas, like in the case of the tragedy of the commons and the overuse of natural resources or an, inter an international body might be formed to enforce limits on nuclear arms. The extent to which this can succeed will depend on how much authority and enforcement power the external actor has, as well as the degree to which its own incentives are properly aligned. And then in the prisoner's dilemma with two suspects, the threat of future punishment might be the threat of getting shanked in prison, and the external actor might be the gang that orders the hit. I hope you're convinced by now that game theory is a useful tool for understanding reality and that many real life situations can be understood through a game theoretic lens. So now let's introduce some other well-known games that are all meant to illustrate some unique type of strategic phenomenon. First, we'll start with what's called the stag hunt. The stag hunt tells the story of two hunters who can only bring down a stag if they cooperate. But instead of cooperating, they can also hunt rabbits on their own. They prefer killing the stag to killing rabbits, but they'd rather hunt rabbits than fail to take down the stag. So the normal form is here on the right, and it shows their utilities. If they work together and get the stag, they both get 10 utility. If they hunt rabbits, then they get one utility. If a hunter tries for the stag and fails, then he gets zero utility. So now let's find any Nash equilibria that this game has. So starting from Hunter 1's perspective, if Hunter 2 is choosing to hunt the stag, then Hunter 1 is going to want to hunt the stag as well. 
But if hunter 2 chooses to hunt rabbits, then hunter 1 will hunt rabbits too. And now let's look at things from hunter 2's perspective. If hunter 1 chooses to hunt the stag, then hunter 2 will want to hunt the stag too. But if hunter 1 chooses to hunt rabbits, then hunter 2 will also choose to hunt rabbits. So remember, we can find Nash equilibria by looking for the boxes where we've circled both outcomes. And so the stag hunt actually has two Nash equilibria, one where both hunters hunt the stag and one where both hunters go hunt rabbits on their own. All right, so what's so special about the stag hunt? The stag hunt illustrates cooperative situations where as long as everyone else is cooperating, I would like to cooperate too. But if anyone else fails to cooperate, then I don't want to cooperate either. So it's different from the prisoner's dilemma because in the prisoner's dilemma, I wouldn't want to cooperate even if everyone else was cooperating. So a typical example of a stag hunt that we're all familiar with is team projects, am I right? In a team project where, uh, where everyone pitching in is crucial, you only really want to work hard if everyone else is working hard. If one person is slacking off and that's enough to tank the whole project, then you wouldn't really want to put in any of your effort either. Another interesting feature of stack hunts is that players can get stuck in a bad equilibrium. So in the bad equilibrium, no one is cooperating on the best outcome. And since no one is doing that, I don't really want to either. And since everyone is thinking this way, we kind of just get stuck in that suboptimal Nash equilibrium. An example of such a situation might be the adoption of electric vehicles, right? Many consumers don't want to buy an EV because they say there aren't enough charging stations, especially in the countryside. And many providers don't want to put charging stations in the countryside because they say there aren't enough EVs. So we end up getting stuck with low EV adoption. In this case, an external actor might need to get involved in order to switch us to a better equilibrium. In the case of EVs, this might involve the government subsidizing EV purchases or supporting the development of EV infrastructure. So this brings up an important issue, which is known as the multiplicity of equilibria. Now, multiplicity of equilibria is just a fancy way of saying more than one equilibrium. And when a game has multiple Nash equilibria, how do we know which one the players will eventually gravitate towards? And honestly, the answer is that we don't. Uh, it might vary depending on the specific details of the setting that we're studying, and thus it requires specific domain expertise in that area to really come to a prediction. And so the question of how to narrow down further between different Nash equilibria more generally is an ongoing area of research in economic theory. Okay, now let's do a game called phone tag. Have you ever dropped a call? And then afterwards, you both tried to call each other back at the same time, and so you missed each other again. Or maybe both of you waited to call the other person back, and so no one ever did. Right? So that's phone tag. And let's represent the situation with game theory. Let's assume that the players get one utility if they manage to reconnect, and zero if they fail to reconnect. And so the normal form is given here on the right. And let's find the Nash equilibria. Uh, so each caller can either call back or wait. And so let's do it from the perspective of caller 1. If caller 2 chooses to call back, then caller 1 should wait. If caller 2 waits, then caller 1 should call back. And now from the perspective of caller 2, if caller 1 chooses to call back, then caller 2 should wait. And if caller 1 chooses to wait, then caller 2 should call back. And so here we have two Nash equilibria. In each one, the callers are doing the opposite thing, but it's stable because as long as the other person is calling back, then you want to wait, um, and as long as the other person is waiting, you want to call back, right? And the callers are getting the same utility in both of the Nash equilibria, so they don't really care uh, which one we choose as long as we agree on which Nash equilibrium we're going to play. So phone tag illustrates games with multiple equilibria, in which the players don't really care which equilibrium is chosen, as long as we all know which one is going to be chosen. Because all that matters is that we can coordinate on which equilibrium to choose, this type of game is often called a coordination game. Now, in coordination games, some kind of authoritative body is usually going to be needed to set the standard, 
so that everyone knows which equilibrium to coordinate on. And so an example might be like which side of the road to drive on or what units of measurement to use, right? But what if there's no authoritative body to set standards? Then how will people know which equilibrium to choose? And the answer is they usually won't. And hence, we have phone tag as a real life experience. Maybe the government should designate some rules about who should call back and who should wait. Nah, that probably wouldn't fly, but maybe you can work it out with your friends and family what your standards are. The next game we'll take a look at is called Chicken. Chicken was a popular game in the 1970s where high testosterone teens would drive their cars straight at each other. Whoever keeps going displays his testicular fortitude and gets the glory in the girls, and whoever swerves out of the way is the chicken. But you have to be careful because if no one swerves, then you're both going to crash, which is worse than being a chicken. So in terms of utilities, we'll assume that winning the glory gives you five utility, being the chicken gives you minus utility, but crashing is even worse and gives you minus 10. And finally, if both of you swerve, then we'll assume that nothing happens and both players each get zero utility. Okay, so let's solve the game. Uh, looking at Team 1's perspective, if Team 2 goes straight, then Team 1 should swerve to avoid the crash. If Team 2 swerves, then Team 1 should go straight to get the glory. If team, uh, from Team 2's perspective, if Team 1 goes straight, then Team 2 should swerve and avoid the crash. If Team 1 swerves, then Team 2 should go straight and get the glory. So looking at chicken, we have two Nash equilibria, but this time if you look at the utilities, you'll see that this time the two players strongly disagree on which Nash equilibrium they prefer. Naturally, team one is going to prefer the one where he gets the glory, and team two is going to prefer the equilibrium where he's the one who's getting the glory. So chicken illustrates games with multiple equilibria, but in which the players want different equilibria. Each equilibrium is good for some of the players, but bad for the others. And so Chicken illustrates situations in which two or more actors are facing off against each other, almost like in a staring contest to see who blinks first. Each side is waiting for the other side to give in, but if they wait for too long, something disastrous could happen. Unlike coordination games, intervention by an external actor is less likely to work because players wouldn't want to abide by the external actor's decisions. They're going to disagree on uh, the decisions chosen by the external actor, and they might even disagree on which external actor to choose to mediate. Uh, in real life, games of chicken can be highly unpredictable, and the results can be explosive, which makes for high tension and actually for good drama. So an example might be the Shaq and Kobe feud, or any other feud between two high-profile sports stars, where both players are vying for uh, the status of top dog on their own teams, but eventually one of them has to take a, so, uh, a subordinate role in order for uh, the two of them to actually win a championship together. Another real-life example uh, might be the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. In this face-off between the U.S. and the USSR, the U.S. wanted Russia to dismantle its nukes on, Cu on Cuba while Russia wanted the U.S. to end its blockade on Cuba and remove its nukes from Italy and Turkey. And so they were sort of uh, staring each other down. Eventually a deal was reached, uh, but this was considered the closest that two countries have ever come to full-scale nuclear war. Okay, so the last illustrative game that we'll study is called Matching Pennies. Now this is a very simple game where two players simultaneously put a coin down on a table. If both coins show the same side, so either both are heads and both or both are tails, uh, then player one wins. If the coins show different sides, then player two wins. And we're going to assume that winning gets you one utility and losing gets you zero. So let's find the Nash equilibria. Okay, so from player one's perspective, if player two chooses heads, then player one should also choose heads. And if player two chooses tails, then player one should choose tails. All right, so now from player two's perspective, if player one chooses heads, then player two should choose tails. If player one chooses tails, then player two should choose heads. So now when we step back and look at this game, we realize that there is no box where both outcomes are circled. And so that means this game actually uh, doesn't have a Nash equilibrium. 
So matching pennies shows that some games don't have a Nash equilibrium. And that means there's no stable set of strategies in this game. If player one does one thing, then player two is going to want to do something else. But if player two does that something else, then player one is going to want to change. And we're going to keep going in circles like that. Now with no Nash equilibrium, games like matching pennies are highly unpredictable and often need to involve guessing what the other player is going to do. So there's going to be an element of psychology to the actual play of the game. Now an example of matching pennies is uh, penalty kicks in soccer, right? Because if the kicker kicks to the left, then the goalie is going to want to dive to the left. But if the goalie dives to the left, then the kicker wants to kick to the right, and so on. Right, and another example would be rush versus pass offense in American football. If the offense is going to go for a rush, then the defense will want to prepare for that. But if the defense is prepared for a rush, then the offense may want to uh, do a pass instead, right? And so on. So games that are used for recreation and sport often have this feature of no Nash equilibrium because it keeps things interesting, right? Over time, players aren't going to uh, gravitate towards just one or two set of strategies that they end up playing over and over again. And so because of that, the game continues to feel fresh and surprising, uh, no matter how many times the players have played it. All right, so let's finish off the lecture by using the tools that we've learned to solve the Russia-Saudi Arabia problem from the last lecture. If you'll recall, um, in the problem, Russia and Saudi Arabia were each choosing how much oil to produce. They could either produce none, low, medium, or high amounts. And the price of oil was going to be determined by the demand curve and the total quantity produced by both suppliers. Uh, so the details of the problem are in the last lecture, uh, but for today we're going to write the situation as a game and use the normal form to solve it. So the players are Russia and Saudi Arabia, right? Their strategies are the four levels of oil production that they each could choose. And the payoffs are the profits that each player gets, depending on how much both players produce together. Uh, so I've written the profits in the normal form here for you, though you should also be able to calculate uh, these payoffs on your own. But the main point of the slide is let's use this normal form to find the Nash equilibrium. Um, and so let's start with Russia's perspective. So if Saudi Arabia chooses to produce none, Russia maximizes its profit by choosing to produce high. If Saudi Arabia chooses low, Russia maximizes its profit by choosing medium. If Saudi Arabia chooses medium, then Russia uh, should also choose medium. And finally, if Saudi Arabia chooses high, then Russia will maximize its profits by choosing low. All right, and now from Saudi Arabia's perspective, if Russia chooses none, then Saudi Arabia will choose high. If Russia chooses low, then Saudi Arabia will choose medium. If Russia chooses medium, then Saudi Arabia will also choose medium. And finally, if Russia chooses high, then Saudi Arabia will choose low. All right, so where's the Nash equilibrium? Well, there's only one, and it's right here, right? Um, where both countries are choosing to produce a medium amount of oil. And both countries are making 1600 in profit. So that was a lot quicker than what we did in the last lecture, right? And that's because the normal form helps us to organize all of the information in one convenient format. Uh, and it's also convenient for finding the best choice in every situation. All right, so one last question. What kind of game is this? That's right, it's a prisoner's dilemma, right? It's a game where they would both want to cooperate on producing a low amount since then they get 1,800 profit each, but they aren't able to do that because if one of them is producing low, then the other one is going to want to produce medium. So let's summarize today's lecture with some key takeaways. First, game theory is the study of strategic interactions between self-interested agents. Second, Nash equilibrium is when each player is choosing their best strategy, given the strategies chosen by other players. And what that means is when we're in a Nash equilibrium, the play is going to be uh, stable in some sense, and this is how we uh, predominantly make predictions in game theory. Third, Prisoner's Dilemma illustrates situations where cooperation is desirable, but impossible or at least very difficult to achieve, 
uh, because everyone has an incentive to break their promise uh, from the cooperative outcome. Fourth, the stag hunt illustrates situations where players will only cooperate if everyone else is cooperating. If anyone else fails to cooperate, then the other players wouldn't want to cooperate either. Fifth, phone tag illustrates what's called a coordination game, which is a game where players don't care about which equilibrium is chosen, as long as we can coordinate on the same one. In these games, good communication or a standard setting uh, body is vital. Sixth, chicken illustrates situations where players disagree on which equilibrium to settle on. Each player wants the other player to give in uh, and let, uh, let us get to the equilibrium which is favored by the other player, um, but this results in unpredictable consequences. And finally, matching pennies illustrates situations where there is no Nash equilibrium and thus no stable set of strategies. These games are highly unpredictable, uh, but often in a desirable way if the games are being played for fun. All right, so that's it for today's lecture. Thank you so much for watching. We're coming in on the end of the class, and the next lecture is going to be the last formal lecture of the course, which I'm calling The Big Ideas. In it, we'll review the main ideas that I want you to take away from the topics that we've already covered, and I'll also talk about some of the most important ideas from other areas of economics that we haven't covered yet. Okay, so that's it. Stay safe and stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.